Good afternoon, everybody. This is a live severe weather briefing. Today, this is a case study on the major severe weather outbreak on April 19, 2011, the 2011 season. And April overall was uh, the most active month in recorded U.S. history. That included the April 15, 2011 outbreak with over 100 tornadoes. It included the super outbreak as well from April 25th through the 27th in Dixie Alley. It also included this outbreak on April 19, 2011 with over 77 tornadoes reported from uh, northeastern Missouri just to the north of uh, uh, St. Louis near the Bowling Green area and also across central Illinois another cluster of supercells developed in the vicinity of a warm front and a surface low that was ejecting off to the northeast. This was the uh, first tornado near Bowling Green, Missouri that you can see here. This was rated an EF1 and uh, believe it or not uh, I do believe it was a, a stronger tornado uh, than the rating was given given the violent motion and those horizontal vortices that were feeding into it. You can see this was also a multiple vortex tornado with substantial vertical winds within it and then we went off to the east and tried to keep up with this original supercell it crossed the Mississippi River we selected uh, an area on the map where it looked like there was a road or a bridge across the Mississippi River but we got there and it was actually a barge crossing so we got on that barge went across the Mississippi River and then targeted an area of supercells in central Illinois in Macoupin County near the Carlinville area and that tornado was rated an EF3 uh, targeted the southernmost cell within that cluster of supercells because that one uh, had the most likely chance uh, of anchoring uh, to, uh, to that warm front and this is a classic setup where you had a very long cold front that extended all the way down into the southern plains and then uh, you also had a surface low that was lifting to the northeast across northern Missouri, eventually into central uh, Illinois. And then those supercells congealed into a line. And then that threat shifted over to more of a line echo wave pattern type of an event. And you can see here in this video, this is the EF3 tornado that was in Macoupin County. And I'm going to show you the uh, damage surveys from this event. This tornado right here, that cone, that was when the Bowling Green, Missouri tornado was first touching down. And uh, a majority of these strong tornadoes early on were from, from two supercell storms. And uh, they produced... I could see three tornadoes, however the reports here have more than that. There were two tornadoes uh, to the north of St. Louis, an EF1 and an EF0, an EF3 and a few other tornadoes across uh, central Illinois as well. And here you could see those reports. A, major a vast majority of those tornado reports were from the line echo wave pattern uh, type of an event as it moved off to the east. Uh, and this was also a, a big open wave, big open wave trough. This was the storm that I just showed you to the north of St. Louis near Bowling Green, uh, Missouri. That was at about 21Z. Uh, that was the first supercell that developed near the surface low. The surface low was tracking from this direction. And then you also had a long cold front that extended all the way down into the southern plains. There was one lone tornado report in the jungle mountains of southeastern Oklahoma there. There was also a tornado report in central Arkansas. You had a few down here in the Boot Hill region uh, of Missouri. Uh, Ozarks basically just on the east side of the Ozarks right near the vicinity of the Mississippi River. I bet there could have been a couple other smaller tornadoes within that cluster as well. But these setups happen quite a bit uh, where you have this long front and you get a lot of uh, severe weather reports down to the south of it but the wind shear profiles are just a little bit too veered and uh, parallel to the front down in this area and that's why you want to target the surface low track along that surface low track low level winds are a bit more backed out of the southeasterly direction we'll look at some photographs that are representative of that central illinois environment near that uh, uh warm front that was lifting off to the northeast and usually the surface low likes to track along that warm front as it lifts off to the north you get a good uh, strong low level jet uh, southwesterly. In this case, it was about 30 to 40 knots ahead of this uh, system because there was a decent uh, open wave. Uh, basically zonal flow at, uh, at the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere, but you did have quite a stout open wave there. Uh, the Storm Prediction Center had a moderate risk, including a threat for strong tornadoes right along this surface low track and that warm front where you had more enhanced wind shear. And then uh, the initial mode was supercell storms, and you even had a broken line of supercells along the, the cold front there. Uh, but the shear profiles just weren't favorable for a robust tornado threat. But one of those supercells developed at about 20Z 
just to, uh, in front of the surface low. This is the, the storm that we targeted initially. We intercepted that tornado uh, near Bowling Green, Missouri. It did damage a few homes. I uh, was given an EF1 rating, and then that one lifted just to the uh, north of the warm front into the stable air, congealed a little bit, and even though it had a few tornado warnings on the Illinois side, it was largely elevated uh, in the stable air, and then a new cluster of supercells developed just to the northeast of St. Louis, and that intensified into the supercell that would produce the EF3 tornado in Macoupin County. And here is the 500 millibar map. The parent 500 millibar map or the parent 500 millibar pattern uh, for this event. Let me pull up this map here. My little computer. If I can even find it. And you can see on this map that this is an open wave, a lot of vorticity eviction ahead of a system like this. Still trying to. Uh, and uh, this is from the Storm Prediction Center archive, but uh, the, basically a neutrally tilted trough, an open wave uh, centered over the central plains there uh, with the surface load developing just to the east of that open wave. Here it is, finally have the map. And here you can see that trough. It looks kind of subtle, but there's a lot of cyclonic curvature here. This is an open wave. You get a lot of vorticity advection out of ahead of open waves like this. And that's because your vorticity is maximized along the trough axis here and when it's not a closed low and in that case then you get the wind uh, that is parallel to the vorticity contours in this case the wind is normal to that max so it's uh, migrating that vorticity max off to the east and just to the east of that vorticity maximum that's where vorticity advection is greatest and uh, that's why they uh, developed a surface low there in northern missouri uh, that lifted off to the northeast across central Illinois. Uh, the central Illinois uh, warm fronts are notorious uh, for being big time tornado producers. And uh, this is a very strong zonal flow in general across the U.S. It's a pretty unstable jet stream configuration. Any little ripple along zonal flow can mature into a much deeper wave. And in this case, this is a large open wave with a lot of strong flow out ahead of it too, in excess of 50 knots at the mid-levels of the atmosphere. You had a southwesterly low-level jet at about 30 to 40 knots. And I'm going to show you what the hodograph looked like as well. But first I want to show you what the Storm Prediction Center had for this event. And uh, there was a large moderate risk, including a big uh, portion of that cold front all the way down into the southern plains. And that's because of the uh, severe weather threat. The tornado threat, however, was maximized along that surface low track from far northeastern Missouri uh, just to the north of St. Louis. That's where the first uh, tornadic supercell uh, put down the EF1 and the EF0 tornado near Bowling Green. Uh, the EF3 was just a little bit to the east of that uh, with another supercell. And these lined out relatively quickly. And then there were a bunch of tornado reports in this region from the line echo wave pattern or uh, a basic QLCS, quasi-linear convective system that moved off to the northeast. And the Storm Prediction Center did a great job on this, even capturing those few lone reports down in central Arkansas and uh, southeastern Oklahoma. Of course, the wind, massive wind area all along the front. Wind uh, doesn't depend as much on the shape of the hodograph as uh, tornadoes do. Uh, as long as you have strong winds throughout a profile, convection can bring those winds down to the surface. You can have microbursts as well that can further accelerate that flow and it can definitely become damaging. And that's why these are big time wind producers all the way down the front as far uh, south southwest as northeastern Texas uh, with this event. And uh, the hail was also robust. An open wave like that often has a stout elevated mixed layer or dry air that it vexes in at the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere that will steepen lapse rates and result in a robust hail threat, with, especially with any supercell structures. I may have extended that a little bit further northeast to include the warm frontal zone and those uh, bit, uh, intense supercell storms that interact with the warm frontal zone, including that one that produced uh, the EF3 tornado. So that's what the Storm Prediction Center had, and they issued a tornado watch, of course, just before uh, those storms develop, and actually outlined an area for that strong tornado potential right along the surface low track. This mesoscale discussion uh, from the Storm Prediction Center labeled that surface low track and the warm front 
Uh, you could certainly tell where you'd want to target during this event. Uh, the, the backed winds are more southeasterly, low-level winds uh, in the vicinity uh, of a warm front like that. Usually elongate the hodographs and can create strong tornado potential. The tornado watch extended all the way to the southwest through the Ozarks uh, because of slightly greater shear just to the south of that surface low track. But what verified was that most of the strong tornadoes were right along that warm front uh, surface low interaction here. Here is a radar image uh, that shows that parent supercell, the, or the initial supercell that developed to the west of Bowling Green. This is as it was crossing the Mississippi River there. And you can already begin to see in this map, in this radar image, some of these prefrontal renegade storms. And in fact, these ones had some severe thunderstorm warnings issued uh, by NWS St. Louis. We had already observed the EF1 tornado near Bowling Green with this storm. You can see some additional supercells that are organizing out along the cold front just to the southwest of the surface low. But the wind shear is really only going to be favorable uh, for strong tornadoes for these supercells right here. Uh, these are just ahead of that surface low track. Uh, these new supercells that are developing just to the north of the St. Louis area have, are candidates to lift more rapidly to the north and get up to that warm frontal zone. That's where they ended up producing. It was actually this storm right here that matured, matured and then as the surface low caught up to it from the west, that's when it really went nuts and had a, a strong tornado on the ground as it was crossing I-55. Uh, just missed uh, a couple of these towns, uh, Carlinsville out there in Macoupin County. But you can already see that these have supercell structures. They've got a bean shape. They've got a sharp reflectivity gradient on the southwest side. This is what I mean by that bean shape. They have a little bit of cyclonic curvature already in their preset patterns. Even when they develop uh, very early, they're already going up rotating. Uh, you know that the uh, southern storm within this cluster is going to have unimpeded access to those uh, southerly, southeasterly surface winds and the southwesterly low-level jet. So once we got stuck at the Mississippi River after observing the EF1 tornado with this initial supercell, we took the barge across and then this storm had lifted off to the north of the warm front into the stable air and then our eyes were down to this cluster of storms and in particular the southernmost supercell and that's because it's ahead of the surface low and uh, the cold front. These storms right here, they're in the southwesterly surface winds, southwesterly 850 winds, uh, those are all parallel to the frontal boundary. So unless these storms turn drastically off to the right, the hodographs are going to be a little bit too flat for those to have a robust tornado threat. Uh, but out here ahead of the surface low in the vicinity of that warm front, you have uh, more of an east-southeasterly type of a surface wind. And then above that, you've got southwesterly winds at about a kilometer above the ground. That's big time directional shear. Also big time speed shear with that. And uh, this is just your classic setup where if you really dominate, play your cards right, you can get a tornado on this storm, and then when this one lifts a little bit north of the surface low, you can get this one when it finally interacts with the surface low track here near Carlinville and that warm frontal zone. And I'm going to show you what the hodographs look like as well. So here is the result of that damage survey from the National Weather Service. These were the storms that were produced by the initial supercell right near the surface low. I'm surprised that this wasn't rated greater uh, than, than an EF1. Uh, that was rated an, an EF1 tornado there, but visually it certainly looked like it had stronger motion in that, even violent motion within it. And then this was the next supercell that developed near Carlinville. This one we also intercepted. Uh, this storm here uh, lifted to the north, became elevated to the north of the warm front, and then that cluster I was just showing you that developed just to the northeast of St. Louis, that matured into a big time supercell that crossed I-55, produced an EF3 tornado there. But really the strongest tornadoes were with these supercell modes early on, right in the track of the surface low, and then everything congealed into a mass of storms, and you had some textbook line echo wave patterns. I believe that the updrafts that are embedded within these squall lines uh, have a storm motion that is forced further right than they would be in that environment and that allows that even to the south of the surface low where you have mainly south southwest winds at all levels with that further right storm motion that's when you can still get some uh, 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 spin ups that are embedded within that line more easily 
and along the surface low track through the Indianapolis area, even in, in through northern Ohio. You also had some tornadoes, even a lone EF1 down into northwestern Alabama there, an EF1 near the Kentucky-Tennessee border. So now let's look at the uh, hodograph. I need to pull this out since for some reason the file disappeared. Should be one of the first ones that I pulled up. And here it is. It's the uh, red curve. And remember, if you're new to hodographs, the hodograph is basically a representation of the wind profile in the atmosphere. You're looking down at the atmosphere with this as well. Uh, this right here is the origin. And you plot it a uh, compass direction. This shows this uh, sounding was at zero Z just to the north of the warm front. And you could tell because that surface wind is out of the northeast. Basically an east northeasterly surface wind you have to the north of the warm front, to the south of the warm front, the winds shift to southerly and it warms up. And right along the warm front you get easterly or east southeasterly winds. And so you can modify this hodograph with a surface wind once the uh, warm front was near Carlinville or lifted off to the north. This is a Springfield sounding. The surface wind vector was likely out of the east southeast into this tornado and then or into this storm and then you had a, a low level jet almost due southerly at about 40, 40 knots at a kilometer above the ground. So that created a nearly 30, over 30 knots of shear between your zero to one kilometer shear vector. Your storm motion of the right mover. This is the left mover right there. The right mover is right about there. And with the hodograph modified for an east southeasterly wind, bring that surface wind up here, you can see that it's pretty uh, a, a favorable critical angle. It's about 60 degrees, uh, 50 to 60 degrees there. Even greater if you can get a further right storm motion and if this low level jet could back just a little bit. But that's a favorable hodograph. There is a lot of wind shear, a lot of storm relative helicity within that curve. The storm relative helicity is proportional to the area within the hodograph curve and enclosed by the storm motion vector but, uh, between a given layer. Uh, here is the one kilometer wind out of the due south. That's the wind vector, just shy of 40 knots. That's the low level jet. And then you have these strong mid and upper level winds out here in the hodograph. That brings the storm motion back sufficiently right to blow up that critical angle and to get pure streamwise vorticity in intake from the storm. Just a real textbook sounding, looking at some of the specifics on here. Surface base cape is zero, and that's because uh, this sounding is just north of the warm front at this time. But you can see some extreme zero to one kilometer helicity, 500 in the zero to one kilometer layer. Let me lift this up just a little bit. These are some of the specs on the sounding. And anything greater than 200 meters squared per second squared in the lowest kilometer is sufficient for even a strong tornado threat. And you've got your zero to one kilometer uh, helicity of 500. You've got a zero to three kilometer helicity of 689. And when the warm front passes through and those surface winds shift from northeasterly more to an east-southeasterly wind, you are going to have a slight decrease in that 0 to 1 kilometer helicity. You're going to have a dramatic increase, though, in the surface base instability. Probably about a 3 to 400 uh, 0 to 1 kilometer shear type of a situation. And I'm going to show you the bigger maps. Right now, this shows the uh, cape. The Cape Axis, very large warm sector with this system. Yeah, you can see a little Cape blob maximized near the surface low near St. Louis and just to the northeast of St. Louis, uh, right near the vicinity of the surface low track. That's uh, due to pooling of the moisture up here along the warm front uh, ahead of that surface low. You can see some convective inhibition uh, further southwest along the warm sector into northeastern Texas into southwest Arkansas. That acted to minimize the tornado threat down there, but you could certainly see uh, the sin hole. Uh, the, bl the blue is a convective inhibition, and where you have the white area there in combination with the surface base cape, uh, that shows that you have a lack of convective inhibition, and you did have that tornado there in southeastern Oklahoma associated with that surface base instability. But you can see the southwest and northeast uh, low-level winds 
all along that front and parallel to that frontal surface, and you don't get those southeasterly winds until you get uh, into, into a path along the surface low. And stepping forward with time, southeastern Missouri, central and southern Illinois remain uncapped. This is at 22Z, 5 o'clock p.m. central time. And you still had a hole in the convective inhibition up here in the vicinity of the surface low. This is just after that EF3 tornado uh, crossed I-55. This is at 6 p.m. Uh, central time. And then you can see a lot of convective inhibition uh, further downstream from that surface low. And that acted to minimize the tornado threat uh, across Indianapolis and into west central Ohio. But you did have some line echo wave pattern uh, type tornadoes there. And then this is the 0 to 1 kilometer effective helicity. Well, this is inflow layer, but basically 0 to 1 kilometer. And you can see that the uh, low level helicity is maximized in east central Missouri into central Illinois here, right along that surface low track. And watch as I step forward with time. You can see that that 0 to 1 kilometer helicity blob even reaches about 400 there, right at about the time of that EF3 tornado in Macoupin County there. So you had an increase in the uh, 0 to 1 kilometer storm relative helicity. And that could be the reason why you had an EF1 tornado just on the Missouri side and an EF3 tornado slightly stronger on the Illinois side. You had a, a, just a, a bit of an increase in the uh, 0 to 1 kilometer wind shear there. Right? And, but you can certainly see the obvious target is in the enhanced 0 to, 0 to 1 kilometer helicity right along that warm front and the uh, surface low track. Here you can see that surface low strengthening with time. That's uh, another characteristic of this open wave. You have a lot of vorticity evection ahead of this open wave, so it continues to intensify that surface low. It's not a weakening surface low, but it's ramping up. The warm front is lifting just to the east of it. Uh, the winds are becoming more southeasterly as those low-level winds want to flow in to the low pressure area. And it intensifies as it moves in towards central Illinois. Eventually, an EF3 tornado right along it just ahead in Carlinville on this day. So really, the, these setups where you have a, a long cold front that extends well to the southwest into the southern plains and you have a surface low, you always want to target the surface low, warm front, double point or triple point, whatever you want to call it, because those low-level winds are just a little bit more southeasterly. And while I can't find a good radar image of the Carlinville tornado, at least you can see here the lead supercell that crosses the Mississippi River after producing the EF1 near Bowling Green. We had a couple other supercells developing along the cold front. But then these, the cluster of supercells that developed just to the north of St. Louis went on to become the Carlinville uh, tornado. There you can see between those two scans, this cluster lifted off to the northeast from the St. Louis area, and then once it got to the warm front, just to the east of that surface low, that's when it really went nuts and started producing tornadoes. And we didn't even have any data. We just knew that there was a cluster of supercells developing to our south from when we crossed the, Miss Missouri, the Mississippi River. But we knew if we kept going east, eventually those storms would run into the warm frontal zone and uh, develop big time tornado potential. And here is some of that EF3 damage that was produced near Carlinville. Uh, farmhouse was completely destroyed. Uh, thankfully, everybody was in their shelter during this event. I don't think there was any loss of life from what I can tell, uh, but still a very dangerous uh, tornado, uh, strong. Not violent, but almost there. Uh, probably did produce some EF4 winds or even EF5 winds during its life cycle, but thankfully didn't hit anything at its peak. So now I'm going to show, bring this video back, and to close out this briefing, I'm going to show you the whole entire video. This was the Bowling Green tornado. You can see those little ripples, gravity waves along the western edge, left edge of the condensation funnel. Look at those little kinks, and then it tries to split into more of a multiple vortex. You can really see the true skeleton inside that vortex. 
You can see the vacuum cleaner above it, the giant vacuum cleaner that stretches and intensifies the tornado vortex underneath it. Everything you see here is all condensation funnel. That's all cloud matter, condensed water. But it is very possible for the tornado to extend wider than the condensation funnel as well. Nearly got up to it when it crossed the road right in front. We didn't have the dominators yet. Storm Chasers was about to start shooting a week after this. So they missed this intercept and the April 15, 2011 intercept, but then joined us for the rest of a very active April. In fact, a record-breaking April, the most active for tornadoes of any month in recorded history. And I only included a little bit of the EF3 at the end of this. I need to um, get some of the uh, raw original videos for these severe weather events, and then I can... Uh, go through and capture more video that shows the entire storm evolution. But when we got on that storm in Macoupin County, it produced one quick tornado and then a main larger funnel came down and then it quickly intensified into the EF3. So a very large tornado, certainly. This is still the Bowling Green, Missouri one. EF1, believe it or not, but I guarantee you this tornado was producing big time winds. It reminded me of a backlit version of the Malvane tornado June 12, 2004. That was also an elephant trunk like this, but was extremely strong. Also with some fine scale structure in there. Look at the, the small vortices dissipating. And then this was the Carlinville tornado. This was the EF3. It reminded me of a smaller version of the June 23rd, 2007 Pipestone Manitoba tornado, which was also a warm frontal storm. However, this one was moving from southwest to northeast. So thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this case study on the April 19, 2011 event. Uh, thank you for your Facebook support. I'm going to continue running these case studies when we don't have anything to, uh, to watch in terms of severe weather. I was looking at the February 25th and 26th event in Dixie Alley, but the latest models have really backed off. Uh, of that trough. Uh, in fact, it completely shears out the system, uh, keeping most of the moisture in the Gulf of Mexico. I do think, though, that as we get closer to early March, that's when uh, the pattern is going to get active again. I think we'll have a pattern shift uh, right around the first part of March, and uh, I do expect it to be a pretty active month. There has been a lot of noise on the uh, comparisons and the sea surface temperature patterns in the Pacific and with the Arctic Oscillation uh, back to 1990, which was uh, an incredible, incredibly active year for tornadoes. In fact, it was even more active than last year. Might be one of the more active seasons in recorded history uh, behind 2004. And if that's any indication of what the spring or the summer is going to be like ahead across the Southern Plains and Dixie Alley, then it is likely going to be a pretty active year uh, for severe weather. There's always going to be tornadoes, probably over a thousand tornadoes in the U.S., uh, there's always going to be dangerous tornadoes as well, whether it's an inactive or an active season. But we'll continue to break it down here and stream live as well as we're storm chasing and launching rockets into these tornadoes using our ground launcher and Dominator 3 as we get closer to the heart of the season. So thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your Wednesday and never stop chasing.